Before we get started with the control panel, which uh, will be just a few minutes, we wanted to take an opportunity to promote another panel that's going on this afternoon that we're especially proud of. Uh, I don't know if anyone can see it or if anyone's received one of these yet, but um, some people that we know uh, are doing a Kickstarter right now. Uh, it is called the Greenlight Tour. Uh, how many of you uh, are, have 3DSs? I imagine a few of you do. Okay, uh, of those of you who have 3DSs, uh, if you like street passing, this is a one-day bus trip that is designed entirely for people who are interested in street passing. Essentially, the bus is going to leave from Washington, D.C., and it's going to hit big Wi-Fi hotspots along I-95 on the way to the Nintendo World Store, and then there's going to be a big meetup of uh, Street Pass NYC at the Nintendo World Store, and there'll just be like street passing stuff happening throughout the day, a uh, chance to visit the Nintendo World Store. But anyway, the Kickstarter and the panel are all about street passing, so if you're interested in street passing, uh, feel free to grab one of these cards. Um, the Kickstarter is going on right now. Essentially, you can either get a t-shirt or get a seat on the bus or both. Um, it promises to be a really fun time. So anyone who's interested, come see us uh, before or uh, just grab one of these cards after and hope to see you there at 4.30 today in panels, uh, one of the panels rooms. Yeah, um, panels four. Yeah, the, the panel this afternoon is all about street passing tips, tricks, uh, strategies, what people are going to do with street pass. And I'll also take this opportunity to say that if you're looking for something to do this afternoon, uh, I'd like to invite all of you to the video game improv. Uh, these guys are sick. Uh, that's something that we're doing uh, at 2 p.m. Um, that's always a very fun event, uh, a laugh riot, as they say. So uh, please come if you can. Um, and that said, I promise that I'm not going to promote any more other things. We're going to focus entirely on this panel that you've come to see. We have an hour to promote other panels that will be on. <laughs> So, what time is it? I got two minutes. So. Let's get started. Okay. If you put this away, yes. We should introduce ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'd like to like see. Hi. Hello. Good Hello. afternoon, all. Um, we're excited to be here yet again at this, our 13th MAGFest. So, we weren't the first one, so we went to the eight and a half one. So. It's technically our 13th, even though we've not been to all of them. Um, is this? That's your one. Get that away. It's my water. Sorry. Yeah. Why don't you introduce yourself? So, uh, my name is Kevin Flanagan. Uh, as Bobby mentioned, we've been doing MAGFest panels uh, like this uh, since before the Mages track existed. Uh, I believe at the first MAGFest we did a kind of video game studies panel. We've been doing things like that ever since. Um, I am uh, currently uh, finishing up my PhD at University of Pittsburgh. I'm a film studies student, uh, and I'll be defending it in like two months, which is kind of scary. Um, and uh, I study video games uh, as kind of a wider interest in visual culture and design. So um, you'll probably notice throughout this panel that I'm interested in tying the history of video games to other media. Um, and so one of the interests that we had in, vi in video game control is that it's something that makes video games unique. Uh, but at the same time, I like to kind of bring that back around and see how that connects with other things. And I'm Bobby Schweizer. I am... I have a saggy microphone. That's weird. Uh, I'm a uh, visiting assistant professor at Georgia Tech, where I teach game studies and game design. I got my PhD there last year. And uh, when we're talking about, you know, what, what types of things we want to talk about for the since we've done so many of these, we've had a ton of topics. There's a chance to really think about uh, you know, the, the types of things we interact with all the time. And one of the things that I liked about choosing this panel this year is that one of the other classes that I'm teaching that's not a game design class is an interaction design class. And how do you use, how do you understand how we interact with things? So there are uh, all these threads that are interrelated, and we're going to talk about them. And uh, we should also say that there was already a control panel in the Mages track. Um, we consulted a little bit beforehand, so hopefully we're not covering too much of the same ground. Um, our approach is uh, very strongly historical, um, so hopefully it's of interest. Um, at the very least, hopefully it unlocks some memories of strange controllers that you've used in the past. Uh, so we're going to start with kind of some general things. We're going to then kind of move through a different uh, set of controller types, a couple of interesting case examples, and then uh, by the end we're going to have it open up to everybody so we can have a big discussion about um, future of control types, uh, also uh, do a Q&A about some of the stuff we presented, but we kind of want to make the end part be what you guys want to make it. So. 
Um, do you want to begin? Yeah, so we're thinking like, well, all right, we need a place to start with what a controller is. We don't really want to define it necessarily, but wanted to at least think about you know, what are some, like a working definition of, just to describe what controllers are. So we thought, well, they're things that you know, give the player a chance to change the game state. Uh, they give you agency, like not only the game state in terms of you know, just making things happen, but they give you agency in the world such that you're making meaningful choices in the way you're manipulating things. Uh, and then also there's the material part of it, which is that the player, or the controller, is positioned in between the player and then the display, the interface, whatever the, the result of it is. And there's a, that relationship is really important. And you know, as, as talking about the definitional uh, basis of what a video game is, I think by most definitions or by many definitions, uh, uh, having some sense of control is necessary for the kind of interactivity that many people define as a main characteristic of what video games are. Um, I also, in, in planning this, we were thinking about how hard it is to define a controller without using the word control to define it, but controllers are really control what happens in a game. I mean, it's pretty commonsensical. Uh, we're having a, a Phil. visual Phil. Uh, moment, so I would like to take this opportunity to ask how everyone is doing. <laughs> I, fine. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're doing well. You look, doing? you look well. I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I had coffee and a, a nice sandwich earlier, so I'm pretty good. It was uh, it was Lebanon bologna. Does anyone know Lebanon bologna? It's lovely. It's it's very tasty. Uh, it's kind of a salami type lunch meat, and I had a nice piece of cheddar cheese on the sandwich, and then everything bagel thin, which are fantastic. I don't know if you guys have had those. Anyway, it seems like we are back in business. Uh, so controllers are tools. Um, they are tools in the sense that um, they enable a player or a, uh, somebody interacting with a game to, to, do, to make a big effect in the game world. So in the way that we think of simple tools and simple machines as allowing for minimum of input for maximum of output, uh, controllers are similar. Um, if you think about it just in a kind of basic level, uh, all one has to do on a gamepad is qui uh, quickly and politely press a button and then the effect in a game world might be something as big as a punch which is something that would take a lot of energy to actually do with the force that one would do it with. So in some way, they, they make big things kind of manageable and doable with ease for a player. Uh, I don't, is there anything else you want to say about that? To uh, video game controllers are not hammers. I should also say that we're not being entirely literal with our images. It could be hammer. It could be hammer. Actually, has anyone here developed a hammer controller? I played a Wii. Okay, <laughs> which when angry, it becomes effectively yeah. the same thing. No, that's good. Um, I've played wall hammer. So, Bobby, why study controllers? It's a great question. Um, so, so much of the history of video games is wrapped up in the materiality of the hardware that runs the software. And when you think about the types of games that are enabled by this hardware or by the hardware, uh, one of the ways to think about them is not only you know the platform that it's running on or whatever the microprocessor is, but what the input device is and you know how that lends. Um, how those controllers lend themselves to a specific type of game or types of games, uh, a variety of game versus like a narrow window of game, depending on what the controller is. So, you know, if you think about everything from tennis for two on, like tennis for two, game played on an oscilloscope needs a control input of some sort that is you know, the, the same type of technology that they'd be using to do any sort of display manipulation. Um, but then you, you build it into a little box and you give it a knob and a button that you can click and suddenly you have uh, a unique input device for this one particular game. And so this is only like the tiniest bit of this um, image that I found on, on Google but has been circulating around for a long time, which is you know how all these controllers are interwoven with one another and they're different companies and controllers that are having similar families. So there are so many controllers that it's certainly worth saying. And I think one reason uh, on a very personal level that it's important to think about controllers is in some ways controllers are the things that we have the most intimate relationship with when we play a game, yet they're also a thing that in a lot of cases we're not paying attention to because our eyes are looking elsewhere. And we're gonna address how sometimes one's attention and one's controller are in the same place, but for a long part of the history of video games, those are separate things. So when I think about my personal history with the Super Nintendo, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is my kind of dirty controller that I used for 10 years to play that system, and kind of all the hours I spent holding that object, even though, you know, when one asks about video game memories, one tends to think of moments in games themselves. So it's, it's an important part of kind of one's relationship to 
one's kind of biography of video games. That's really nice. So that's my little poetic interlude, so please take that away if, if you take away nothing else. But we want to quickly survey different controller types, and hopefully some of these you'll find to be fun or funny. Um, but we also think that it's important to distinguish that there are so many types of game controllers in the history of video games, from the common to the obscure, and a lot of them are very different from one another, even though their essential function is the same. Um, so we begin uh, where a lot of people begin with paddles or knobs. Um, which, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with something like Atari, is uh, you manipulate images on screen using a knob as one would find on a mixing board or something else. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, as you can tell from the, the paddle for the Atari, uh, it's to replicate the movement of tennis and pong or something like that. Um, but it's a relatively simple type of controller that doesn't allow a ton of variation in action. Right, which is why you find you know, a paddle originally attached to something like the Atari Home Pong, which is a console designed specifically to run the one game um, and play that game, and then you have the controller that's uh, attached to it. And then you find that those things, uh, as you think about those controls at home and the controls in arcades that are related to paddles, um, the, the the fact that so many of those games are about uh, things bouncing around the screen, uh, that the paddle makes sense. And the paddle is interesting because with the paddle, there's a particular spatial relationship between your movement of the paddle or your, you know, the dial on the knob and what is going on on the screen. So you know, it's supposed to be a one-to-one -one mapping of you know, when you tw twist the paddle, it does not move the, the or when you twist your knob, or it doesn't move the paddle at the bottom of the screen and break out. Um, over the course of the amount of time as if you're running force, like you're holding left on a D-pad, but rather it moves it to the exact position at the exact time that you're doing it. Such that trying to play a game like Breakout on something that has a D-pad rather than a paddle is just difficult. extraordinarily difficult. Right. Um, and maybe like a mouse, you know, having your paddle attached to a mouse is more like the original experience of something like Breakout than a D-pad or you know, keyboard or whatever we'll be able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're moving to joysticks, which many people are familiar with. Um, I picked the iconic Sidewinder, which I imagine many people had, the Microsoft Sidewinder, uh, as one of the images. Um, joysticks uh, have been around for a long part of the history of video games. Um, they are a, I think, uh, without knowing really a technical reason for it, I think they enable a pretty subtle amount of control, and they are good for games that demand precision because they, they tend to reposition themselves in the kind of neutral position mm -hmm. after movement. So there's, in a way, they, I think they give at least the illusion of a kind of agency, uh, especially if a game is, is programmed to be responsive to them well. Right, and you find joysticks you know, existing in all these different setups where you might use a joystick as you would use a flight stick, um, and you know, that being where the design comes from. But then you use something like you look at the Atari VCS and the, the joystick there, and you think, well, that could have really been, could that have been any controller? Could that have been some other thing? And the joystick kind of goes away, and that I mean, it becomes a very specialized thing that people who have joysticks are typically using them for flight sims. Or, uh, but the joystick itself kind of, you know, evolves over time into the analog stick. You know, it shrinks down, it moves, but it's the same type of thing. So you know, even though you're not clutching. Uh, your analog stick like this, and you have your thumb on top of it. The movement is still the same, uh, and, and reflects the same early patterns, so it's evolved. Mm. Uh, so we have trackballs, and uh, there are lots of great opportunities, by the way, to go to the arcade room while at MAGFest and get one's hands on all of these things. Uh, this is a trackball uh, reconstituted, I think, from Centipede. But um, uh, trackballs, uh, they tend to give a really precise sense of movement, um, similar to the paddle, uh, I think. And the danger, uh, just from a practical perspective, of using a trackball is kind of over-eagerness to move it, because they kind of tend to be kind of uh, quick to move. I don't really know the word for that. Um, but uh, trackballs are something that a lot of games don't seem to use in arcades after a certain point, yet, uh, Trackballs find another home with um, PC gaming, as many people probably had those trackball mice um, that I sadly don't see all that much anymore. Yeah, because the track trackball. pads kind of tip those over, but those were nice. Uh, something I don't know. Yeah, there's, say, really. there's, a, there's a, a force that you get to use when you're using a trackball to play something like Centipede, and you know the way the way that you're interacting with it changes your relationship too. It's not really a precise mo a movement necessarily. It is like the 
the dialogue between like whipping the trackball as fast as possible, and then moments where you need to like you know slowly weave, dodge in and out of something, and then moving back into this, and then of course they uh, enable movement in all directions, as is the thing, which is why you would use that instead of uh, uh, paddle. Mm -hmm. And you can also do the terrible thing where you don't let your hand off, and then like it's worn down, and then your finger kind of gets caught and pinches your skin. Yeah, that's bad. Um, that's that's Collateral damage associated with playing. That's next to death. Yeah, so if right. that's happened to you this weekend, I apologize from the deepest well of my soul. Uh, mouse, uh, which uh, replicates a similar type of motion. Uh, mice are, you know, mice are well in use uh, still. Uh, a lot of genres of games uh, have become built around control schemes that use the mouse for looking especially. I think mice are significant in the history of gaming because they map in a relatively fluid relationship between one's hand movement and kind of how one regards the world of a game. So especially in first person shooters, um, a mouse enables a kind of illusion of like mastery of space and of kind of uh, one's ability to feel like one can fully explore a world. Uh, mice are also uh, something that occasionally, as you see from this image, have kind of found their way into consoles. This is the mouse associated with Mario Paint for SNES. And in a way, when that peripheral came out in the 90s, having a mouse with a computer was more of a novelty. Now it seems to be almost a cliche and something that's been around for a long time. Yeah, the, the mouse is an interesting thing because it's you know, something that's attached to the computer uh, kind of regularly and you know, a part of the, the idea in the history of computing as a manipulation device. And so as you're trying to figure out, as you're making games for the computer, people were adapting the tools that they had available as these control devices, a keyboard and device. And thinking about okay, what, I have I have the mouse already. What can I do with it? And um, you know, before you end up with like a set control scheme that everyone uses, before mouse look becomes a thing, you know, mice get used in all sorts of weird ways. So you might use you know the mouse to move forward or backwards, and people might um, you know have like run as whatever's attached to like the left and the right click. Like, these really like, strange schemes that if you go back and play some older games, when people haven't quite figured out what they want to do with it yet. Uh, and haven't quite figured out you know, 3D gaming, then you get oh, something that seems really natural to us now. Like, oh yeah, like the mouse is like your you know, camera or your eyes, and you manipulate it you know, on the, the desk to replicate moving your head around. And sure, that makes a tons of sense. Well, but it's also interesting because previous to these types of 3D games, there's a whole genre of point-and-click adventures, which you know, is having a kind of nice renaissance right now. And that, you know, the fact that the control scheme is more or less in the name of the genre is pretty significant. There aren't a ton of genres in video games where how you control it. I mean, I guess there are a couple. I, I, I should think before I speak, but maybe people will come no, up with it. No, it's it's no, it's better to just say things. Um, so, so that you know, but you know, it's that whole genre is built around using a mouse as one would in a desktop interface to uh, replicate exploration. And, and the mouse, and the Super Nintendo mouse, is a funny thing for me because. It's it takes something that is a, you know, effectively a toy and then adds a work peripheral to it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the fact that it's used Mario Paint is a creative, expressive game is one thing, but like, as soon as you hook up a mouse to something, like, all right, well, nope, now this is ruined forever. Like, now we're, start, we're just gonna get the spreadsheet software and right. everything <laughs> on the Super Nintendo. I think the, the, the secret history of video games is finding ways to have spreadsheet software on every console. <laughs> yeah. um, so keyboards uh, naturally come with PC gaming. Um, keyboards, uh, I think it goes without saying, having the advantage of having many ways to map input. Um, so certain genres of games, uh, strategy games for example, uh, specifically real-time strategy games, uh, are really important to have kind of a specific complex actions mapped to specific keys. Um, keyboards, uh, especially around first-person shooters, have also evolved to have you know, relatively standard control schemes, WSAD for movement, etc. But it's funny because one of the things we're going to talk about in a minute is kind of customization and modding, and can, keyboards are one of the places to go for kind of um, really finding one's preferred control identity, because with most games that you play with the keyboard, you are the one who is able to decide what is comfortable for you, what reflexively you're best with doing. Um, I'm sure there are people who map, you know, the tab button to do something that I would not map the tab button to do, but... Yeah, when I think of gaming keyboards, I think of the Apple wireless. Yeah, I think of the most uh, high-performance, uh, grip-intensive <laughs> keyboard. But then you get, you get these modifications where people are trying to think about, well, how, you know, how can we change the keyboard, how can we make it better, how can we make this layout better suited for different types of use? So you get ergonomic keyboards for people who work in offices and, you know, need to 
spending all day, you know, typing and don't want to get carpal tunnel syndrome. But then, you know, you think about, okay, well, let's get keyboards where um, we're going to, like, shape it in a particular way because we know it's being used primarily for gaming. And so you get, you know, focus on the WASD keys and, you know, you get a number pad that is um, you know, set up in a particular way that, you know, is better shaped to the hand. So you've taken the keyboard and, like, remolded it to fit these other purposes. Yeah, it's, it's still a keyboard, so it works like a keyboard. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's not recognizable as the, you know, the work keyboard. You can still write your churn papers on it. Okay, game pads. Uh, we chose, of course, the greatest game pad in the history of the world as the uh, example for that. But game pads, uh, in some ways, especially game pads of the most recent, couple recent console generations, are weirdly the distillation of lessons from other controller types all kind of made into one device. As Bobby mentioned earlier, by having analog sticks, one can essentially replicate the joystick by um, having a, a kind of refined button schemes, they kind of are gesturing toward um, con popular control schemes from other genres. So by, you know, for example, putting the X and A keys like that, you're kind of drawing attention to the success of the SNES controller and the ease with which one maps jump and attack to, you know, side-scrolling games like Super Metroid. And... Question for you all. Does anyone have the problem where you still mix up which controller you're using based on you know, the letters that are on the buttons, and you're like, oh, I just pressed the Super Nintendo X instead of the Xbox, and right. it's crap, like, I screwed up. Ten years, all of, the time. ten years of playing the 360, and I still don't know what buttons I'm actually yeah. pressing. <laughs> and actually, if one were to ask me what the colors of the buttons are right now, I don't know what they are, because I'm... So in a way, this, this panel is largely inspired by how little we pay attention to controllers usually when, in fact, there's a lot going on with that. Oh, we don't, we don't have a slide for this, but we were talking about it when we were preparing this, which is... One thing that happens when you're playing a game that makes you aware of the controller suddenly is, you know, games have quick time events or things that tell you, you know, oh, like smash on A now. And then the, there's sometimes a moment, like, if you know, if you know, where, you know where all the buttons are, you're good to go, that's fine. But every once in a while, you're like, A? Hang on. Oh, you're right, okay. And then you're, you're suddenly aware that you have a controller in your hand again, which may have disappeared without, like, a prompt on the screen that breaks the fourth wall. I just want to tell this anecdote, too, real quickly. We're going to talk about feedback and control a little bit in a second, but um, one of my scariest experiences in my entire life has been putting my 360 controller down on a hardwood and table during a quick time event, and suddenly the rumble feedback's incredibly strong, and I thought my house was collapsing because it was so strong, and I nearly had a heart attack. But to me, that's the moment where I'm acutely aware of a controller in a way that I had not been, you know, as I put it down to eat my sandwich or whatever I was doing. Sandwiches come back as many times as I can bring them up in this panel. Did we, um, did we ever bring about, we talk about Rumble? For no, we did. We, we, have those we will be, and if we don't talk about it enough to your liking, we can talk about it more in the Q&A. Uh, light guns, uh, I think, are near and dear to everybody's hearts. Um, light guns have you know, been uh, an input type of control for a long time. I even think in, um, uh, in uh, defense software in the 60s that monitors things like um, nuclear and missile launches, something like light pens are used in a similar way to light guns as they develop in the history of video games. Um, but it's funny when you look back at old consoles how for a certain period of time having a peripheral that was gun-like seemed to be a kind of de rigor thing. And that gets revitalized um, not as a necessity but as more of a curio in the 16-bit era. Uh, many people are probably familiar with the Super Scope 6 and the, um, what's the second one called again? The Menacer. The Menacer. Um, and then Increasingly, gun peripherals are kind of niche things that one has to buy specifically to software. They don't really seem to be something that in current console generations one designs whole genres of games around. Yeah, so you know, the light gun emerges from shooting galleries, uh, like physical shooting galleries, and then light shooting galleries in Japanese arcades, and then becomes you know, a standard part of the you know, consoles here or you know, pack in with you know, whatever the hardware that you're buying. And then, like you say now, you know, the gun is still kind of a novelty, like a, a peripheral gun is still a novelty that you encounter in arcades. And, you know, in the PlayStation 2 era, there's the, the gun com. But then something like the Wii remote, in a way, revives mm -hmm. the pointing nature of the gun uh, without actually becoming the gun itself or it being used. Though one can add places. a peripheral to make it more gun like, one I'm sure can design a gun <laughs> sort of chassis for it. You know. But we have just gotten we're like we're we're fine with just you know using our uh, analog sticks to point an imaginary gun at things instead and, of the games. Like, you know, is, is are we going to get back to a point where the next big Call of Duty game comes with a gun attachment? Because that is that's what they decided is like you know the next way to uh, 
to finalize the franchise. Or the because there are not nearly enough guns in Call of Duty games already. Right? <laughs> um, well, funny that we should talk about this because we're using speaking it right Call now. Of Duty. But uh, speaking of Call of Duty, microphones. Uh, <laughs> so microphones are control input devices in many games. Um, SingStar uh, Saga games that require you know singing or voice activation. Uh, increasingly, like that, voice activation is coming back as an important part of uh, at least console interfaces. Um, One's uh, phone, uh, does anyone have that, and this is not a game, but does anyone have that Amazon robot? Do you know what I'm talking about? The one that you can like talk to and like it buys things for you? Oh, okay, I see a couple people. Two people. Back. Yeah, person in the back over there. Um, so, uh, talk, uh, voice activation and um, using that to uh, enact change in a game. And, and what's fascinating is here, here for the first time of, of this presentation so far is a, an input device that doesn't really require one to use one's hands. Um, and there are, as we're going to point out, there are multiple different input devices that don't use hands. But when we think about video games, we tend to think about equivalency between hand control and control in game world. Um, we all, we, in, in remembering some controllers for this presentation, there was a peripheral for the NES that yeah. used, uh, for laser mission I believe it was, that was, uh, it, it used voice activation, you'd say fire, and then depending on where the, the kind of, I don't know what to call it, reticle? Depending on where the reticle was and where you were pointing on screen, it would fire at specific things. So like, also, uh, voice and, uh, vision and voice have become something that works together to map uh, change in a game. Yeah, and then the, you know, you can just, you could say that the presence of microphones um, in the modern gaming consoles for multiplayer games, like being a way to you know, interact with other people, communicate with people on your team or other teams, like even though that is not necessarily having an effect directly on the game, like you're not using your voice to control anything, it is still a controller of sorts because you know, through your discussions of strategy, you're manipulating the game world. So, right. And it's also a great way for 12-year-olds to yell at you. If you haven't had enough 12-year-olds yell at you, I recommend doing that. Or, or if you have 12 year olds have yelled, yelled at you today, you know, might as well get your daily quotient in. That's a really good idea for a panel next year. Uh, 12 year like video games in which 12 year olds yell at you. Yeah. I would love to do that panel. Just like put a video on. Like, All right, everyone, right. sit here and feel miserable. How great is this? Uh, arcade <laughs> sticks. So, I mean, arcade sticks, again, are a combination of different input devices, but they're kind of their own type of uh, controller. Um, we chose a kind of uh, a stick that can be used for many different purposes, but obviously many different arcade games had their own stick, sometimes unique stick set up. Um, arcade sticks are now synonymous with competitive fighting game play, uh, though there are other genres of games that many people prefer to play using a stick. Um, arcade sticks obviously use joysticks uh, in a specific way that uh, you know enables a kind of uh, I'm trying to figure out how I want to say this. Precision. I, uh, precision, yeah, and then also they're kind of big uh, in a way because I think when you're designing an arcade game, you can't really tell who's going to be playing it, and right. so having something that one can assume is more accessible to more people, uh, people with different ability to control. You know? Also sturdier. Sturdier. Oh, Making right, that's material that's right. hopefully not going to break. Right. You jamming that someone does on it. Scientists are still working on a pizza-resistant joystick. I think there's actually a lot of <laughs> governmental research money in finding ways to keep pizza grease off of... Uh, I could get a grant to do that. You get a grant to do that. And look out for next year's MAGFest when we talk about video game peripherals and pizza. Um, well, these 12 year olds yell at you. They will 12 year olds yell at you. Um, is there anything else you want to say about arcade sticks uh, no. right now? Okay. Uh, so we have resistive touch screens. Um, you're better at explaining this than I am if, for those yeah, who are Yeah, if you're also a technical person and you, you know, I'm doing a bad job of explaining the differences here, but you know, a resistive touch, touch screen uh, is based on you know, the, the pressure of your press's ability to make two thin films uh, that are you know, wired with. Uh, with circuits, so that when you push one down, it touches the other one, and then it gives you that position as to where the touch was recorded, which is you know, the early and easier way of uh, doing touchscreen devices. And so, you think about something, the DS here is a good example, not because it's you know one of the first ones to use resist resistive touchscreens, you have know, devices going back for a while, but the fact that the 3DS still uses that same resistive technology as opposed to the capacitive touchscreen that's in you know, your uh, Smartphone. smartphone, tablets, or the Vita, uh, is because they want, or they needed to use that touch, the resistive touchscreen to make the 3DS backwards compatible with uh, original DS games. So that is why your 3DS seems to be languishing in technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and then capacitive touchscreens, as Bobby mentioned, uh, 
Common in tablets, uh, smartphones, PCs, um, they enable uh, multiple sites of control simultaneously. Um, there are all sorts of other advantages to them. Right, and then you, you know, because they enable multiple points of uh, touching as opposed to res as resistive, where it's looking for one specific input, that you not only can you manipulate more things, you, you can think about the ways that you're using your fingers, and then they, you know, people invented the entire paradigms of what gestures mean for things. So establishing, you know, uh, wipes with your fingers and three finger scrolling and two finger scrolling, like you effectively get to make up the language of how you interact with um, this, this, this touch screen. The, the, hand the jazz hand. hands on the screen motion, which we all use all the time. Uh, I also want to point out that this is an example of a controller where one's screen and one's controller are in the same place. And that's, a, I think, a sort of weirdly important philosophical moment in the history of video games because whereas uh, we mentioned earlier, the controller that you use is often out of sight when you're playing a game. Here you have no choice but to regard how your hands work while you play a game. And when you think about it, that can be something that gets in your way, but as all of us know from playing touchscreen games, you sort of filter out that aspect of the experience as you're playing. Um, and you don't find necessarily, like if I'm playing a first person shooter on a tablet, I don't feel constantly as if my hands are blocking me from seeing what I'm doing because the interface is designed such that it keeps my hands out of the way and I've kind of learned to not pay too much attention to it. Yeah. That... But if, yes, okay, that works. So as you think about all these you know, input devices though, these input devices privilege a particular type of person you know, with uh, you know, certain abilities that are to be expected that would say, okay, the average human has you know, five fingers on each hand and they can move them in this particular way. Uh, but in a lot of cases, yeah, we use these things to interact with what is going on inside of the game, but it also becomes you know, the major way that uh, games become inaccessible to other people. So you know, think about people with, with different abilities you know, someone who um, has arthritis. There, there are people who are doing a lot of research now for how do you, how do you, what do you do to get uh, older people to play games if they have arthritis? They still want to play, and so the Wii became one of the popular things in that realm because you know it was a, a generally thing, a thing that was easier to hold, and if it wasn't easy to hold, it could be modded, so you could add something to it to make it fit the hand better. Um, and then you think about, okay, well, you know, what happens when? Uh, someone has like muscle degeneration because of an illness or something, how can they do it? So the image here is from, uh, the kid's name is Thomas, and the story's about you know, a guy who was interested in looking at like, someone who loved video games was uh, suddenly unable to play them because of his illness. And so he started thinking like, well, what can I do about it? How can I think about these controllers in a different way? And so he effectively mods himself, uh, or mods these modular controllers that are specifically tailored for an individual. So, you know, there are, there are things to be aware of when we're designing these controllers as to you know, who it fits, who's it for, who does it allow to play games, and who does it prevent from playing games. And I think uh, as much as um, oftentimes one has to uh, get a customized controller to suit one's abilities, so for example, paraplegic gamers uh, have ways to control games using their mouth and things like that. Um, increasingly, I think some designers are at least aware of making games that can be played by more people and don't just privilege someone having a certain set of skills. So there are, there's at least some awareness, though I don't think it's a big enough awareness that's affecting the types of games one sees on the market in general. But um, the fact that we're actually talking about this is actually, I think, a good sign for video gaming as a kind of cultural pursuit because, you know, when, when we think about it, this building that we're in right now is designed for handicap accessibility. So there's all sorts of things if you were to walk down the hallway or go into certain rooms that have been made such with the, with the fact in mind that yes, someone in a wheelchair might need to get into this bathroom, or somebody who is unable to walk upstairs needs to get to this area. So you know, the world we live in, I think, is increasingly becoming sensitive to it. We forgot we forgot something in this. Um, What's that? We forgot to put in uh, motion controls. Oh, we most totally missed our motion stuff. controls, <laughs> which uh, actually is kind of where we're going to end up because motion controls is, are, are one thing that uh, one sees in all sorts of different um, game interfaces right now. Do we, do we want to table it and keep going with the touch? Uh, this well, or do you want to talk about I was just going to say that, that there, there is a way of doing controlling that does not involve a device that is in your hands. And that, right. that is motion control. And you know, some of them do have, so your Wii's and your PlayStation boots are a physical thing. Uh, but you know, your camera-based controls with your Connect, the PlayStation Eye toy, which is way better than Connect because it had an inch of it. Right. Way better like this, things happen. Uh, so yeah, that, there's a, a paradigm which I only forgot to put a slide before. And uh, you know, obviously the best game of the last generation is Double Time Adventure Theater. Is that what it's called? The game. Oh, oh yeah, Double Time Adventure. Yeah, that's so. Anyway, that 
we can just table that for now. We wanted to bring up a couple of examples of controllers that are designed specifically with one game in mind. So some of you may be familiar with Steel Battalion, which comes with a fantastic rig that allows one to control uh, the in-game kind of uh, technology. Um, and it, it's an interface that obviously does a lot more than what a typical Xbox controller does. Um, but the experience of playing Steel Battalion is as much about manipulating this fantastic controller as it is about whatever happens in the game. So it's also an example of a game where control is, is, is the way it's marketed. It's probably the reason why a lot of us know about Steel Battalion in general. I've only played a few minutes of it. Actually, I would be happy to know, does anyone know if there is a Steel Battalion downstairs in the console room? Has anyone brought, okay, there's not, okay. Uh, that's a bummer. Um, usually, what's great, what's great about MAGFest nowadays is that usually we can say, oh, and if you want to see this, just go to this room because there is an example of it, but that's something that there isn't. Um, and Steel Battalion is funny, too, because they went the entirely opposite direction when they made the sequel to Steel Battalion when they wanted to use the Kinect, where there were no buttons for it. Right. So well, go from every button to nothing. That's a sort of schizophrenic uh, response, I think. Um, so quickly, and then uh, a lot of you of a certain age, if you're anywhere near our age, will remember the fantastic peripheral, the Sega Activator. <laughs> Regularly voted one of the worst controllers of all time. Um, the idea is, is pretty fascinating. It's motion control. Um, it sort of doubles as uh, minimal fitness as well, which is, you know, in, since the minimal Wii era, fitness. minimal fitness. Since the Wii era, you know, fitness and control have become increasingly a way to market an experience to people who may not play games or to people who play games but who want to lose a little bit of weight. I have a Sega Activator. It's garbage. Um, but the selling point of it is that, you, know, you can see here the images, it is not just because dude with abs is able to... Uh, the dude with abs does not come with the device, I don't think. <laughs> oh. But the idea that, like, okay, well what if we have a way of replicating the types of actions that you do in something like a fighting game, which is, you know, all, basically all of the, uh, all but one of them? Yeah, all of the, uh, the box art, or screenshots on the box here, are from fighting games. So it's like, okay, well, you can punch and you can kick. So the way the activator works is that it basically figures out you know how high you are. So so punches it just maps to you know a button. So it says okay, there's the octagon on the floor, and we know that you know your arm is this high or like your foot is this low, and then it's just the input. And it's, it just it doesn't work at all. Like there's no mapping um, to the actions that you're doing, what's going on in the game. It is just like retranslating it through another controller and then. Making and we it. we think back at controllers as tools. If one of the advantages of controllers is to exert the minimal effort to get the maximum effect in the game, this reverses that principle and makes you do the most amount of work for an effect that you can easily achieve by not doing much. So that's fascinating to me. I love it when people make things overly complicated for themselves, and this is like the best example of that. Um, so uh, I, I didn't have a word for this, and maybe you guys have a word for this, but I'm fascinated by what I call referent controllers, which is controllers that are designed to look like real world objects where the object that one uses in the game is also kind of the shape of the controller. So I'm thinking of the crossbow add-on for the Wii, or this controller for Wii which makes bowling ball be the thing that you actually use for Wii bowling. Um, I don't really know what the word for that is, but I'm, the idea is that somehow one's game experience would be more like real or more meaningful if the thing that they were holding was the thing that they're using in the game. I'm thinking also of, you know, playing uh, Red Steel, whatever that Wii game is, and like rendering one's controller to look more like a samurai sword, because I mean, obviously the fantasy of playing that game is, I want to use a samurai sword, and this is pretty cool, right? Um, so anyway, I, whatever, whatever word we can come up with for those, I'm fascinated by them, and I love how they're often very niche, and they're often very specific to a certain game or a certain genre of games. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything about them, but... I mean, you can... The really interesting thing to me is this image here on the right is not only you know, showing what kind of junk you can buy for something, but you know, I imagine this was being sold at a Costco, and it's like, oh yeah, you buy a Wii, and you get this like packet of all these accessories. Mm -hmm. But this little packet says almost everything you need to know about the Wii. Like this translates by having all these objects in front of you, it translates all the things that are going to be possible in these games. So like, okay, I, like you know that there are going to be tennis games, you know that there's going to be a driving game, you know that there's going to be something where you're shooting and you don't have to be told through you know, any other mechanism. No, I don't know if anyone agrees with me on this, but looking at this kid, it almost looks like things that you would add to an electric toothbrush, <laughs> like to make a kid use it. It's like, oh, you know, you're shooting your teeth. It's pretty cool, right? You know, um, I don't know. So anyway, there's... there's Trademark us right now. We want to yeah, quickly yeah. reverse the terms we've been talking about controllers before opening it up for Q&A and, and observations. So. Bobby had the idea that rather than think about it um, from the perspective we've been talking about, about the controller then beginning the game, we now we want to talk about experiences that require certain types of controllers. So 
uh, not game primal, but experience primal. Uh, so okay. we'll give an example, and you'll kind of know what we're talking about more. But so think about like what do you what do you use controllers for? What do what do controllers do? What is the experience for them? So um, you know you can use controllers for simulation. The idea that you are trying to recreate a particular uh, event or a particular scene, you know, in your living room here with Hoda uh, set up with three monitors to make it look like you're sitting inside of the cockpit, um, and it's not just about you know having. Uh, a better input for the game. It's about recreating an entire experience you know, by, by buying these controllers and by you know, using them in a particular way. Uh, flight simulation is probably the example most of us are familiar with where some people strive as best as possible to replicate all aspects of what one would actually take to fly an airplane. And you know, and it translates, oftentimes these setups translate into the acquisition of real world skills because you know, you cannot fly this plane unless you have X experience of simulation successful before you get trusted with actually flying the plane yourself. I want to buy a racing wheel. Right. Can I well, buy a racing wheel? Right. Well, you can. Dad, uh, can I have a racing wheel? The beauty of America is that if you have money for it, you can buy it. Um, this, then that idea we're talking about is a little bit different. So I, this is another word we're not quite sure of, but we're going to try to explain what we mean with it. When you want to, uh, and, and you may need to talk about it because I'm kind of forgetting how we formulated it, but when you use a controller to replicate some other experience in the world, is that the idea? Yeah, so it's a little, it's like a tweak on what simulation is. So you're not simulating the act of playing a guitar here, but rather you're, you're playing a guitar, uh, the actual guitar with Rocksmith and using a game as an interface uh, or a way, a way to do that. So you're taking the actual object and using that as the thing, as opposed to an adapted version like you know, your, your rock band. All your, all your various rock band plastic instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, there is something here that is that one-to-one -one mapping of the actual thing, and then it becomes input for the game. Right, and so theoretically, by playing enough Rocksmith, one does become better at guitar and can demonstrate that one is better, whereas playing a lot of rock band does not necessarily mean that you become a good guitar player, right? Um, relaxation, this one I don't know too much about, but this is fascinating. So I've tried this. This is, um, it's called Journey to the Wild Divine. It's a Deepak Chopra game, and <laughs> it is... Drop the mic. <laughs> It has it has um, sensors, so you know, pulse sensors for your fingers, and the idea is that you succeed in the game by lowering your pulse by re relaxing. And I've played a couple games that people have made that use this um, thing, but you, know, you think about Nintendo. Nintendo promised us the vitality sensor and never delivered on it. And we could have things like this instead, but you know, this this is supposed to be about um, your body's feedback into a system and into a game. In this case. And it's fascinating too because like it's a lot of the like scientific research being done on games maps body response to things so heartbeat blood pressure etc. So there's maybe avenues for control that map to other bodily responses both voluntary and involuntary. Um, you know, the, the you see something gross on screen you gag whatever it is. Um, physicality, uh, you know, there's a great opportunity to play a lot of JS Joust at Magfest. If you haven't played before, please play it while you're here. Um, but it's a it's a game and a game interface designed first and foremost around interacting with people physically in a space rather than in a virtual space. Uh, is that kind of what you mean? Yes. Okay. Yes, Good. that is what I mean. I, and I played um, a game that was like JS Joust uh, this past fall, and the way that the game was set up is that instead of Joust, you can have a ton of space. There was a small amount of space that was like taped off on the floor, and everyone had move controllers. And people were on teams, and the, the goal of the game, was similar to Joust, was you have to put your controller in a certain position, and when it's in that position, it starts shaking, and then you have to hold it there, and there's like an invisible timer that's going up, you know, that's running on the computer, so you don't really know. But they put everyone like right on top of each other, and so you're trying to get other people to like lose the focus and lose the position of their controller. So by forcing everyone into a small space, it uh, is, like pushes the physicality even further. So exercise, uh, we talked about it a little bit already, but um, games, uh, this has been a kind of concern obviously for about 30 years, but the idea that you can um, find ways to incentivize people to exercise by using what's fun about video games or what video games do well. Um, and you know the fact that these are increasingly uh, efforts that are kind of um, Focused on the perception, and you know, obviously, the perception remains that um, video gaming habits start with people when they're children. And this is, uh, I think, an increased attempt in the education system in general is to attach the sense of exercise as being in some ways synonymous with video gaming, and to kind of defeat the stereotype of gaming as something that's not mobile. But what we think we've demonstrated here is that 
video game playing has always been about moving to some degree or another, and it's various degrees, right? Uh, speaking of exercise. Speaking of exercise, uh, Smoochy. Uh, so you, I don't know this game very well, but okay. So uh, <laughs> no, I'm gonna have kissed before I do this. This is a, a project that um, someone at Georgia Tech worked on, so I know her, and uh, it was called the Kiss Controller, and it was um, sensors mounted inside or on your tongue. You, you put the thing on your tongue, and then the way to uh, activate the game was to have to kiss somebody else so that you could create contact between the sensors on one person's tongue and the sensors on another person's tongue. The idea was that it's supposed to be about um, creating a sen that like, particular sense of intimacy and then tying it to the other thing. So you're using the, the back and forth motion of like rolling your tongue around here to direct where the bowling ball is going to go. And then you can it. Um, so and we got to speed up to have uh, more time for Q&A. So anyway, KISS game. Uh, sensorial experimentation. So. Uh, using the, the Res Trans controller, uh, which apparently people adapted to use as a vibrator. Um, is that yeah. what we need to say about that? Okay, so <laughs> the fact that um, sexual pleasure can be attained through a video game controller, probably not something envisioned by the creators, but definitely a smart adaptation. <laughs> the greatest arcade stick in the history of, of the world. So modding obviously is a big part of controller use. Making, a, making or constructing or using a controller that suits a specific player's ability and desire. And so um, obviously in tournament arcade fighting you see all, all sorts of great custom sticks. We are pretty sure this is the best one that we can quickly find on Google. Um, if anyone sees this at Magfest I would drop whatever I'm doing and run to take a picture myself. Um, but uh, you know a lot of what we're saying is the caveat is with the right know-how, almost any type of controller or control scheme is customizable. So what we're saying is to be taken, you know, anyway. So then this is an example of repurposing a controller for using it for a way it was not meant to be used. That this is somebody who beat Ninja Gaiden using a DDR pad, right? <laughs> Which is fascinating to me because Again, they're making more work, but they're doing something that is hard anyway, which beating Ninja Gaiden is difficult enough, but doing it using one's feet is blows my mind. It makes me feel like a feeble person. The video is fun to watch because he actually he speeds up the video, because otherwise it'd be intolerably boring. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, something to do after the panel. And so we're gonna just fit all a couple ideas and then just have uh, about 10 minutes. We wanted more time, but we got to talking too much. Um, so I'm interested, as I said, with film studies, in the possibility, and there could already be this, I don't know, uh, of, of controlling with just one's retina. So there's study, there's, there's kind of cognitive film studies work being done between scientists and people who study movies about um, how, what people look at when they're watching movies, and you can track eye motion in relation to movies to think about how framing is going over with an audience, like in this, this is a shot from There Will Be Blood, and the scientists involved have multiple people watching There Will Be Blood, and they're looking to see where people are focusing their eyes. And the idea is that it both tells us aesthetic things about the movie, but it also can be used by companies to think about best, better ways to make movies for audiences, right? What I'm interested in, though, is the possibility of using this for gaming, and again, it may already be here, but the idea of being able to control a game just based on what one is looking at. And I think in some ways that takes the um, tactility and the, the sense of movement to about the minimal level. And it could be interesting to see what games get designed around that. Um, so next, uh, quickly, this is a great game. Does anyone know Punch the Custard? Okay, sorry. So and this, this actually, maybe we should put this in this order here, but using um, small customizable technologies like Arduino boards with sensors built into them uh, to make your own controllers for various uses. So in the case of the game Punch the Custard, there is a bowl of custard and it has a sensor embedded in it. And so the way to interact with the game is to actually like punch inside the bowl. Um, so you are able then to use those like small tech or small pieces of hardware to put controllers and things that are you know, not necessarily designed to be controllers. So I think that the, the future of the weird controlling is you know, people's creativity with you know, hackable cheap software or hardware. Okay, so you know, we've got a couple ideas here. Uh, this is another one a lot of people are familiar with. Is this is a great limit case in control because a lot of you probably heard about this. Outsourcing the playing of Pokemon to people watching a Twitch channel. So the controller is not one person necessarily, but it's a, a, a hive mind of people, some of whom are, want the game to kind of progress, others of whom want to sabotage what's happening, but people controlling, people as an aggregate controlling the action in the game. Um, and even, even funnier in some ways are controllers that don't even need people. So this is the case of somebody who put sensors on their fish 
and mapped quadrants in a fish tank to controlling Pokemon, right? So that's great because we think about playing video games as a human-centric thing, so let's blow your mind and say, well, what about animals playing video games, right? So, um, you know, check your human privilege, right? Uh, and then the final case study is Oculus Rift, because Oculus Rift is a great kind of confluence of a lot of what we've been talking about. Your screen and your controller are essentially the same thing. You move your head, which moves the screen, you also move in the game world based on how one regards it. Right, so like, at this point, you know, to what extent is Oculus Rift a display, to what extent is it a controller? It does have, you know, motion controls, but you still need another thing in your hands to go along with it to make it happen. So, we have sort of your, your weird edge case here. Right, and so, sorry, this is the last slide. Joyce was unable to join us, but uh, we hopefully did her well by what we talked about. We have just a little bit of time, so uh, ideas about new types of control schemes, uh, examples that you guys have that you think work well with some of the stuff we've been throwing out here. I think the general purpose of this panel was just to be like, video game control is kind of weird, and here's why it's weird, and here's a lot of cool examples of things. But um, are there things anyone wants to bring up uh, to kind of share with everybody? If you want to call yes. people. Yes, I'll okay. just go up right here in the front. Uh, I know a couple of days ago, there have been all this hype about the Microsoft HoloLens, which a yeah. lot of people are saying, oh my god, it's better than the Rift, all these things. The uh, HoloLens. Yeah, yeah, it's of course still kind of fresh and exciting, but uh, do you guys have any thoughts on that kind of thing? The HoloLens is interesting. I, you know, I don't know, again, it's like the Rift in which, it, is it display or is it controller? You know, how are you interacting with the things in the world? Um, you know, if, if you're able to move around a room and interact with an object by you know, picking up the, the virtual object and that's being like, you know, shown into your eyes. Um, then, then again, like, your body becomes the controller in that case. And I think of uh, you know, augmented reality games, so anything that you know, where you have your camera on your phone and you're like, pointing it and looking around the room, you know, is, is the mere act of looking through this display the controller or is it, you know, I have to touch it in a certain way, uh, the controller. So the HoloLens, presents a lot of opportunities to think about, well, what are the controllers that we design to use with this technology? Uh, yeah, we'll go from front and then we'll go right back. Um, well, you mentioned two things. Uh, you mentioned the Oculus Rift and you mentioned, you know, looking down at your controller when there's a quick time event, like, Rook, what button is which? And I'm just wondering how it's possible to reconcile these. Like, there are games that require the whole keyboard and, you know, you're wearing your goggles, you can't tell what is where unless you've memorized your entire thing. I think some, some of it is a... You should know your home row. Right. Quirky. <laughs> Quir Quir yeah. yeah. Uh, I think some of it is... It's a lot of... Uh, what we haven't used yet, but it's it kind, of, it's kind of crucial all this is intuition. I think a lot of designers and developers want to create intuitive interfaces that even without having to necessarily look at a keyboard or uh, buttons that one can kind of pick up because it seems as though the most logical way to play the game is by doing that. So I think in some ways the way to reconcile it is to create as natural an interface as possible where one doesn't feel like one has to break oneself away from the immersion of whatever experience. And, but, and if you lose it, you have an easy way to find your way back to whatever it is. Right. But yeah, you're, you're, the example you give is fascinating because it would be a nightmare to be like, okay, here's an amazing game for Oculus Rift, but you need to essentially type out five paragraphs worth of flawless prose in order to play it right. You know, that's, that's kind of a weird disjunction between what those things do well, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so what strikes me is uh, interesting about uh, video game controllers, and to a lesser extent ACI in general, is that the early controllers were very abstract. You press a button, you press a D-pad, that can mean any number of things, and as such, the same controller could be used for any different number of games, in any kind of genres, any kind of groups, any kind of control schemes. Mm -hmm. These controllers, a lot of the ones that you've been talking about, tend to become more niche, more focused, more domain specific. Mm -hmm. um, so my question becomes: How? What kind of? What kind of very generalizable next gen controller can we really see? I mean, one that comes to mind was the Wiimote. When I, I never really loved the Wiimote in most of the, the applications I ever saw it in, mostly because I thought that it never really did a good job of translating. It just seemed like a game like, like, oh, you can swing this way to do a sword. Well, you don't mm -hmm. have to press the button just as easily to be less complicated. One area where I thought that worked really well was in Mario Galaxy, and if you remember when he jumps on top of the, the star ball, mm -hmm. and you kind of have to maneuver him through the level, uh, the level by uh, tilting it back and forth. It gave a sense of this imprecision, of this sense that things could move backwards and forward, and in that sense, the application of the Wevo seemed like a good general practice. Right, yeah. So I use that as a question to say, what kind of general purpose controllers could we really see going forward? 
There's one possibility and that scares me. I don't like it at all, but it's the idea of make, make this your controller, change the interface on this, whatever you need to. And, and it doesn't have to be a flat thing necessarily, but what if, what if the next controller is not one that's been designed to have analog sticks and you know, specifically being used for um, you know, first person shooters, but what if you take the, you know, whatever Valve worked on with their, their like, little touchpad areas on the, the prototypes for Steam boxes, um, or think about things like you know on the Vita screen, you can map certain actions so that they're you know a touch away or well. DS one example you, you said know. your students came up with, I thought this was fascinating, is a, a fully modular controller. So essentially swappable parts in the different quadrants of a presumably a gamepad to do different actions well. So and so ontologically or on some level, it's still a controller or one controller, but it's really suited to the customizability of multiple functions, right? right? Yeah, modern controllers are designed for shooting, so. Right. Something else we can right. So that yeah. So that would be, I guess, a quick version of it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about normal electric control? Control. You are probably more interested in that. Right. So yeah, kind of when I was talking about some of the cognitive film study stuff, I'm fascinated by that because it would be one of the closest ways that we could model to the outside world what like telepathy would look like. Right. So I know that that's not scientific. That's kind of a cult. But I'm really interested in it on that level because the idea is that. By mapping sensors to uh, you know, electrical responses in the brain, we can kind of translate that into movement in a game world or manipulation of objects. I think that's a really cool way forward if, if people can find a way to simplify it and make it, you know, because the difficulty would be one could start, one could start second guessing how one's controlling or weird things could go on in your brain and suddenly you don't have control because, oh my god, I'm coughing or I'm having a stroke or something, like what's going on, right? Hopefully no one has a stroke when they're playing. That'd be a hilarious set of YouTube, right? <laughs> <laughs> this guy totally has a stroke while he's playing this game, right? Um, no, but that, I think that's actually a perfect example of things that we'll see in the next couple of years, get, and, and, and maybe eventually on the consumer level, because right now I think it's at a very R&D stage, right? Uh, actually, there are a few, um, at least board-style games out um, that use it, and there were, at least there was a couple years ago, and uh, there's actually at least two uh, where you can order them online, um, video game setups. Okay. They're very, very, very simplistic. Right. But the, but the idea of that is, is fascinating, I think. Yeah. Is there more? Uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of ways to go. I, I think mechanics-wise, you know, like, like Tempest and the knob, I mean, you cannot, you can hardly separate those. Three, right. right. And, but you can't do that very well on a controller. You mm -hmm. know, or, and, and, you know, a shuffle thing. So mechanically, you know, some are better than other dance right? You don't do dance bed on your but with the Oculus Rift, when you're talking about the tablets and your hand being in the way, and you're just talking about the, the all general purpose controller with the tablet, mm -hmm. which I think is a hard way to idea as well. <laughs> <laughs> I never really realized this whole idea of presence, which is all the talk right now, the buzz, that we've had that forever, the persistence of presence and how important it is. Like, you know, you never dream of bringing your keyboard and mouse to the arcade, you know. Mm -hmm. You just wouldn't. But, you know, you're sitting at home trying a PC game, and all of a sudden, like, I gotta get out. I gotta go and click my mouse before I play this game, and it kill. It, 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 it's a buzz kill, yeah. you know. And I never realized the persistence of presence is, regardless of the mechanics, really is, is like a big issue. And I I have almost this for a long time. I have almost no presence when I'm playing games anyway, because I'm always like looking at my phone every chance I get. Like something's not happening here, down to here, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Right, but I think what you're what you're piecing out maybe one of the what will increasingly be a big tension because if if one sort of trend in gaming is toward, uh, still toward AAA immersion um, bigness and, and all consumability, then yeah, the, the control will be that presence and that distraction and you know, people will work on and finesse control schemes to minimize that. But then I think also, and I, I, I know we've talked about this in MAGFest at various points and I've, even just in the hallways with people, I'm fascinated by the rise of distracted gaming, so mobile, quick gaming, or, or or people playing multiple games at once, things like that. And in that case, the presence is, is something that's always there and you don't get that kind of um, immersive connection. So I think I think you're, you're right in saying it's really specific to, are you doing multiple games right yeah. now? Is that, okay. <laughs> Three devices on two different types of set screens and you only have two hands, so. 4 DS. 4DS, yeah. <laughs> I made this thing called the 4DS, pretty great. Um, yeah, so I, I don't really know, but yeah, I think you're right, that's, you know. Uh, are there things we want to bring up uh, in the back there? And then we'll work away. Back we have about a minute. Oh, we have only a minute left. Okay. If what you have is in the spirit of closing thoughts, that's also cool. Uh, <laughs> I think so.
No? Anyone have a big kind of... And, and I should say again, um, it, we have more time. Uh, we're going to go do this video game improv thing, which we invite you all to. But then there's the street passing panel, for those of you who came in late, that we'd love to see you all at. That's at 4.30 in panels 4. But after that panel, if you want to come up and talk more about control, I'm happy to do that. Because unfortunately, I don't think we can dwell in this room super long right now. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyone have a closing thought? Hopefully this was fun and interesting and you got some controllers to mess around with uh, in your world. Um, hopefully we also didn't ruin gaming for you by making you suddenly very aware of what you're doing. Uh, you know, that was not the intention. So thank you guys very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of MAGFest. Thank you.